we're going to present some background information that's going to be relevant to the first project. In particular, uh, what we're going to do is just go over some notation, talk about Ohm's law, talk about Kirchhoff's nodes law, then talk about Kirchhoff's loop law, and try to put all those things together to talk about how we use systems of equations to describe a circuit. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk about notation. And the, what we need here first is to think about what is a circuit. So the basic circuits we're going to look at are going to have batteries and resistors. Uh, when you start adding things like capacitors and uh, inductors, you're going to need differential equations. So we're just going to focus on the simplest case where we just have resistors. So you can think of a circuit, in this case, as having some voltage source or battery and a set of resistors. And so in practice, they may look something like this. Trying to figure out how to build this and look at this is can be complicated for big circuits. So oftentimes what we do is we try to simplify the diagram and put it in a schematic that we can abstract and look at. So in terms of the diagram or the schematics, if we take a resistor, the symbol that we're going to use for a resistor are these uh, squiggly lines like this. So that means that there's going to be a resistor in the circuit. For a battery, we're going to use something that looks like this, just these two parallel lines where one line is smaller than the other. And that is going to tell us that we're going to have some voltage source that's going to be generating uh, the voltage potential. And so when we go to look at this in terms of the schematic, we can now, instead of looking at something more complicated like this, we can abstract it and look at it in this kind of terms. And this was what we're going to be using now to try to understand what this thing looks like and how to build our system of equations to describe it. All right, now we are ready to start figuring out what we can do for the actual calculations now that we have the notation and know what the circuit is looking like. There's going to be three things we need. The first one is Ohm's law. And with Ohm's law, what happened is uh, Georg Ohm, a long time ago, was uh, doing some experiments and trying to find the relationship between voltages and currents for very simple circuits. So we have some voltage here and then some resistor here. He looked at wires of different lengths and uh, different diameters. And so you've got current basically just flows around the circuit like this. And what he found was that there's a relationship between the current and the voltage. And that, rel that relationship is a straight line. So in particular, he found that the voltage is proportional to the current. So if you double the voltage, you'll double the current. If you increase the voltage by 50%, the uh, current will increase by 50%. So that implies that there's some constant We'll call it R, where V is equal to I times R, and this R is oftentimes called the resistance. Okay, so the idea here is that uh, the bigger the resistance, then the bigger the voltage you need to get a certain value of the current. Okay, um, and so this relationship right here is called Ohm's law, and for a given um, resistor. Right. We, we label that resistor R1, R2, whatever. That's going to have some resistance associated with it, and that's the R that we're going to use in this equation. Um, okay. The second thing we're going to need is something called Kirchhoff's node law. And the basic idea is that if you think of a current uh, going into a junction, so you have wires coming out and they meet in one place, whatever goes in has to come out. So in this case, if I just go around here and look at it, all the currents, if I assume the currents are in these particular directions, I1 is going in, I2 is leaving, so I subtract that, I3 is going in, and then I4 is leaving, so I subtract. So if I add up all the positives and then subtract all the negatives, that should all equal zero because the ingoing minus the outgoing uh, all have to cancel each other out. And so this is Kirchhoff's node law. And what we're, one thing you're going to find is that if you make a bad assumption about this direction, so for example, suppose I4 really 
was going the opposite direction, it's going to be okay. What's going to end up happening is that in your calculation, you'll get a negative value for the I4, and that just means that the current is going in the different direction. So the main thing here is pick these directions and be consistent, and everything else will come out in the wash. It's just that you need to be careful about how you interpret your final results. So we have Kirchhoff's node law. Basically, all the current going in minus all the current going out has to add up to zero. And the final one is Kirchhoff's loop law. This is a conservation of energy. So the idea is that you have some um, big, huge circuit, and it's complicated. So first thing you do is you make assumptions about which way the currents are going. So I'll just assume that current is I1 is going that way, I2, I3, I4. So I'm just going to make do the simplest thing here. And again, it's okay. Oops, this is going to be I10. This will be I11, I12. If I guess wrong and it's really going in a different direction, I'll just get a negative and I just got to be careful how I interpret what that means. Okay, and so now if I were to just think about this, if I start here. and I walk around a loop, as I go around, the total change in the potential has to add up to zero. So basically if I walk, if an electron were to go around from here to here, it can't have a greater potential than as it started. And so then we can use uh, um, Ohm's law then to figure out that change in the potential. So as I go from here, and you've got to be very careful, the direction that you walk around matters. As you go from here to here, because you're assuming the current is going in that direction, from here to here, you're going to lose potential right, because you're going to lose energy as you go through that resistor. So this will be um, a negative change in your potential. But then as you go from here to here, this is going to be a positive because you're going against the current. and you have to have a higher potential where you ended up at. So if you look at the change in the potential from here to here, because you're going upstream, you're going to have a higher potential in that direction. Right? And remember, across a resistor, the change in the potential is going to be the resistance, whatever that is, times the current. So you use Ohm's law to figure out what's going on across there, and Ohm's law going across there. And then you can do that for uh, any loop in the system. So as an example, so let's be careful here. So I'm assuming I6 goes in that direction, I7 goes in that direction. So if I choose that loop, and I walk in that direction, then what's going to happen? So starting here, as I go across there, I'm going to lose I7, and that resistance is R7. And then as I go from there to there, I'm going to increase in potential because I'm going upstream. Right Up here is going to have a higher potential. So this is going to be I6 times R6. So this is just Ohm's law for that resistor. That's Ohm's law for that resistor. Since I'm going downstream, I'm going to lose potential. Because I go upstream, I gain potential. And if I end up at that same place, my total change in potential has to be zero. I can't gain any kind of energy if I start here and end here. And so now that's one equation. And I can do that for all of these different um, loops in here. So that was an arbitrary choice. And that, that total change has to be zero. Now I need to be a little careful here. So what do I have? I had I6, I7, and I8. Just assume that. So now suppose, I'm going to need one more here. No, nope, actually let's go with this. So, so what do I have? If I go around that circle, 
or that loop, I'm going to have, let's see, so that's going to be minus i7 r7, and then I'm going to gain across there, so that's plus i6 r6 is 0. Now let's look again, so now suppose I look at a different loop. So now this time, suppose I look at this loop and I go around that way. As I come across here, I'm going downstream. So when I get to the bottom here, I'm going to have lower potential because I'm going downstream with the resistor. So I'll have minus I8 R8. As I come across here, I'm going up the resistor. So I'm going to have a higher potential up here. Right? Otherwise, it would be flowing the other direction. So this will give me I7 R7 is 0. Now suppose I had chosen a different loop. Suppose I had gone from here and walked around this loop right here. If I do that, as I go from here to here, I'm going to lose potential. It's going to be minus I8 R8. As I go from there to there, I'm going to gain potential. So that's going to be plus I6 R6, and then I end up where I started, zero. Now notice, if I take this loop and add it to this loop, and so as I go, I'm going to go in that direction up that resistor, I'm going to be going the opposite direction in that same resistor, that is basically exactly the same thing as going all the way around like that. And if you look at these three equations, if I take minus I7 R7 plus I6 R6 equals 0, minus I8 R8 plus I7 R7 equals 0, then if I add those two equations, that plus that is 0, and I get minus I8 R8 plus I6 R6 equals 0, which is exactly that same equation. So you cannot just arbitrarily choose these loops. If, you do, if you're not careful, you'll end up with loops that are linearly dependent, and you won't be able to solve your system of equations. Right? And you can think of this physically. When you add these loops, when you go across each other, they'll cancel out and you can figure out which of these loops will depend on one another. So let's look at an example. This is the classic example. Um, for very first thing you do is you make assumption about uh, what's going on with the current. So I'm going to call this current I1. I've got a battery here, so that's going to be give me an increase in potential. I've got a node there. I'm going to assume that's I2. And this is going to be I3. And I've got a node here, so this is what? I2 coming in, I3 going in, and then coming out. I'm going to have to have I1 again because it has to be the same current as I go there. So let's see. I'm going to pick this loop. We'll call that loop 1. And then I'm going to look at this loop call that loop 2. I will not use a big loop around here all the way around. I could, but I would have to get rid of one of my other loops. Notice that loop 1 plus loop 2, I would cancel that out and I'd get a big loop all the way around. So let's see. So what are my equations? If I go loop 1, if I start right here and go around this circuit, as I go from here to here, this is a battery, my potential is going to increase by V1. Okay, so we know that's going to jump up because that, that, that plus symbol means that's the positive direction. Now as I come across here, so I'm assuming the current is flowing downhill like that. So by that assumption, I'm going to lose potential. because I'm going to go from upstream to downstream. It's going to be I3 
R1 because that's the resistance for that. And then I'm going to come across here and I'm going to get start where I end up where I started. So that's my loop one. For loop two, I'm going to just start there. As I come across here, I'm going downstream, so I'm going to lose potential. So this is going to be minus, and this is I2, R2. Then come up here, and because I'm going upstream across this resistor, I'm going to gain potential. I have to have a higher potential when I end up here. So that's going to be my I3, R1. Now I end up where I started, so that total has to be zero. Now let's see, let's back up a second. So what is it I'm trying to find? I'm trying to find I1, I2, and I3. So I need three equations. I've got, because I have three unknowns, I have two, so now I need one more. I can't use this big loop because it'll be linearly dependent. So I'm going to use my node law. So I'm going to look at this thing. I'll call this node 1. Whatever's going in, so I've got I1 going in, I2 going out, and I3 going out has to add up to zero. And now I've got my three equations, three unknowns. Let me rewrite them. So V1, I'm assuming this is a battery, I'm assuming V1 is a constant. So this first equation is minus R I3 R1 is minus V1. And I have minus I2 R2 plus I3 R1 is 0. And then for this equation, I have I1 minus I2 minus I3 is 0. I'm assuming I know the values of the resistances. So I'm assuming I know R1 and R2. So I can put this in an augmented matrix. So this column is going to be associated with I1. This column I2, this is I3. This is the right hand side. So what is this? This is going to say I've got 0 I1, 0 I2, minus R1 is equal to minus V1. So that's that equation. This equation, let's see, I've got 0 I1 minus R2 I2. And then here I'm going to have R1 I3 is equal to 0. And then coming across here, I'm going to have 1 times I1 minus 1 times I2 minus 1 times I3 is 0. And now I've got my augmented matrix and I can solve this thing. And you notice if I do some row operations here, if I flip these so that I get, uh, if I flip rows 1 and 3, and I leave row 2 alone, this is now in row echelon form, and I can actually go through and solve this. And notice my only restriction here in terms of solving this is that R2 is not 0 and R1 is not 0. Right? If R2 is 0, then I cannot solve this thing uh, uniquely. Okay, thank you.